Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to Junior Doan's The Spark. I'm Junior Doan, thank you for joining us. My guest today is Simon Van Boy, award-winning and best-selling author of 10 books of fiction, three books of philosophy, including The Illusion of Separateness. Welcome, Simon, I'm thrilled to have you here. This is an adventure for both of us. Me too. Yes, good. So how, how did you come to the desire or realization that you could make a living and a profession out of being a writer? I tried other things. Um, I pruned roses for a while. I am, you know, an avid gardener. Not that I get to garden much in New York, but um, I worked uh, a security job. I tried teaching at a university. Um, I took my exams to be a banker. And um, I realized that um, really, when my life is over, I want to be able to say that I've done what I really wanted to do. Like there's nothing, what's the wor that, that's the worst that could happen. You know, not to live in poverty or to have to live, you know, on an island off Maine, which actually sounds quite nice. Yes. But um, really just to, to, to do what I wanted to do. Unlike my parents' generation who felt obligated to live up to the ideals of property ownership and all these sorts of sort of post-war ideas, I really felt I was doomed to freedom. And comfort level for them. Um, An adventure for you? I think so. But what voice inside you told you banking was wrong? Or any of the other things you tried? Uh, I suppose there's nothing I really want um, except uh, to be able to um, write down the stories that I think are important and that helped me develop emotionally as a person. What part of that develops you emotionally? I think it's, it's, it's a form of prayer in many ways. Um, you know, you sit down in a quiet place and you just, almost like a stone sinking slowly to the bottom of a sea, you know, you, you look around and you pick things up that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. You know, T.S. Eliot said that we're distracted from distraction by distraction. Yes. So I, I wanted to minimize that. Does culture affect that? Mm. I think so. I think that's why New York is such a special place, is because you can masquerade, you know, uh, in any culture, you know, because it offers such a, uh, you know, a, um, a, uh, a multiplicity of faiths and ideas and... At least in America. Yeah, in New York. Oh, in New York, yes. I, I mean, what's interesting is when you go to, say, France and you leave Paris and you go to rural France, yes. um, the level of culture is still quite high. Um, but uh, when you leave New York City or Los Angeles or Chicago uh, and you drive into the countryside, it's almost like going back in time. Interesting, interesting. I wonder what's the role of loneliness in the sinking to the bottom and um, mm. seeing things. I think the writer's life is quite a lonely one um, because you're, I think you have to almost keep a, a distance when you're writing in order to be impartial and to be objective. That's why it's difficult to write with pictures of my wife or daughter you know, on my desk. You know, because my, they distract? Yeah, because that's that's the Simon who does that's the Simon that they see and that you see. But I mean, this is the Simon that is going to die in hopefully about fifty, sixty years. But it, I don't really. I mean, I existed before I was born as much as I'm going to after I die. Which Talk is to me about that. Well, what I mean is, um, there's this person right. inside who thinks he's Simon. He thinks he's male, and he thinks he lives in New York, but. It's really just the conditions of my life that I've been led to believe are my life. So when I write, I try and almost crack through that, what um, I suppose Jean-Paul Sartre would have called 
mauvaise foi, bad faith, or character armor, to get through that character armor to the core of this person who doesn't have a name and doesn't have an age and doesn't have an identity outside of merely existing. Would you say that, that would be a soul? I think so. I mean, I, I, my daughter said to me once, what do you think of the soul, Dad? And I think, oh, it's quite nice. I mean, poets have written about it. Um, and, um, but I said, you know, it's a theory. There may be no such thing. Just like a subconscious, there may be no such thing as a subconscious. And uh, she seemed actually quite excited by the idea that it was a theory. Whereas most people, I think, are terrified. Of what? But that's youth for you. Um, of there not being a soul. Oh, I, I, just to personalize, I think that's where all the information is. You know, mm. that is the, the source of whatever you're talking about to the mm. person inside that isn't, yeah. you know, wearing a shawl and just yeah. like what you said. That's the essence of life, the spark. The spark, mm. yes, and to celebrate it and mm. to find it. Mm. Um, I often wonder, in your case, when you write, and you're trying to get to the bottom and pick and, and choose, how much do relationships intrude every once in a while as you discover things um, in your outside life? I mean, your, your oh, wife or well, child or the grocer? I, I always put my, I, I decided early to put my wife and daughter first because it's not their fault. I mean, <laughs> that uh, they want to know what time it is or, What's the weather like? Or, you know, they're just normal questions. And the thing is, if I, if I fail at being a good father or a good husband, I think that's reprehensible. I think that's, uh, I think that's unforgivable. But if I fail at being a writer, I'm just another schmuck who, you know, failed at being a writer. So I'd rather fail at writing than my relationships with people who I chose, choose to commit to. You know, that's noble because so many writers go the other way. <laughs> well, I was disappointed. Largely in growing up in many ways. How so? Well, I, I just don't want to repeat the past. Um, I grew up in a household where people's emotions were locked inside prisons that had no guards, no locks. They were free to leave at any time, but they just remained like, you know, a seed that wouldn't germinate. So I foolishly let mine germinate. <laughs> I wouldn't say foolishly, that's brave. Or maybe it isn't brave. Maybe there is, that's the only true root. Mm. Well, I think, didn't Emily Dickinson say something like, um, nature is a haunted house, but art is a house that tries to be haunted. Mm. So my relationship with my wife and daughter and people I, I, I choose to have intimacy with, that's my haunted house. And so art is really just a sort of uh, clumsy reflection of those relationships retold. I'm thinking about that. So you really have to have a lot of relationships if there are relationships retold in the writing. I think so. I think it's good to, um, to, to you know, what did Dylan Thomas write? Hearts that you broke long ago have long, long been breaking others. Oh, I did not know that, but that is poignant. Yeah. So when you write, um, how do you keep fresh? Mm, that's a good question. Um, that's actually quite difficult. Um, and the key is to always be introducing myself to new concepts and new ideas, and especially new musicians. Um, I've been, you know, reluctant to enter the gates of Wagner. But I, I have recently, and it's a sort of, it's like this handsome muscle, <laughs> you know, uh, that just wraps itself around you. Uh, and uh, it's just, you know, when my wife comes home from work, there's Wagner playing in the background, in the car. My daughter's on the point of running away. <laughs> oh. um, yes. And um, so, you know, last year it was somebody else, and the year before it was somebody else. So each new book uh, requires a new set of- Yeah. Uh, through music. A new set of suspects, a new set of, um, of different people. So you have a purposeful um, program, as it were, that maybe overstates it, but change the music. Would you change what you see? Yeah, you know, it's amazing the extent to, to how we control what we see. Hmm. I mean, the French explorer 
Teilhard said at the end of his life, he says, I've come to realize that the world is entirely lit up from within. By which he meant? That, um, that the world is what we want it to be. Yes. I mean, objectively, it it's, couldn't be any worse and it couldn't be any better. It is as the Tao says, is. But um, for him, he thought that so much of um, our feeling of the world is, um, is, a, is a conscious effort. And choice. I think it's a choice. When we were raising our daughter, and you know you have one mm. yourself, they got into all kinds of time frames and mental outlooks and blame and this and that. Yeah. And I would tell her, change the story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, want to change your feelings? Change the story. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's but it's hard to do as a discipline, apparently, because people blame all, everyone all the time, which I don't think is useful. Yeah, it's true. I think, this, I think because we're so afraid of failing, because we're, I, I suppose in American culture especially, uh, you know, fear is the perfect companion for consumerism. Because really? when we're afraid, oh, we, we buy. So, um, you know, I think once capitalism, you know, starts to crack even more and, and things are sort of reshaped. I, I, you know, I, you never hear anybody saying, oh God, I wish it was 1653. I mean, I wish we could go back. You know. <laughs> not I, me. <laughs> no, not me either. I mean, I mean, I go back to the 80s maybe for a few weeks, have some fun, but um, I think that we've never been better than we right, are now. Right, exactly. Yeah. And the future is good. Yeah, so, so I think people will look back on us with sympathy and a little disgust, just as we look back on people in, say, the 1500s with sympathy and disgust. Well, there's, we're in a nihilistic period right now, I think, in a hedonism and, and nihilism. Mm. But that's not the American um, personality for very long, and no. I hope. <laughs> well, we saw it in the 1930s. Yes. You know, um, yes, my grandmother took in hobos. You know what mm. hobos were? They rode the trains and yeah. should jump off in different places. They call, they're homeless people now. Yes. <laughs> but they'll call them outdoorsmen soon. Yes, true, but interesting. Mm -hmm. So I, I... That's very kind of her. Yes, considering that she had to use her charm to mm -hmm. get the grocer to extend them credit for food because my grandfather was an immigrant in the third quarter of the 19th century, Hungarian Jew. Oh, and Ashkenazi. Yes, and he um, came here, he did different things, but by that time he was in real estate and nobody was buying, so the rent couldn't be paid, but the taxes had to, you know, you had to pay the taxes, so mm. it was a hard personal time for them. Yeah. And and still, that was the American nature, you sure. know, to help out. Absolutely. And I, uh, I, I don't think you'd find that in another I don't think country. So. Uh, we undersell our good points to ourselves. Absolutely. When I go down to Kentucky, which is a place I find very interesting, I go down about once a year. A lot of my friends down there are, are not of the same political belief system as myself, but right. they're the most warm, generous people. Right. Um, and in fact, if they have a failing, it's that they're too trusting. That's an American nature, too. Yeah, but enormously generous people. Yeah. I mean, if I called somebody today and said, you know, I'm having a crisis, he'd get in his truck and just drive up. Yes, and don't you admire that? Mm. The generosity of heart? Yeah. Well, I'm a believer in the capitalistic system, just to, mm. you know, encourage you. Because there are really only three ways. One is the monarchy. One is what we have. You know, mm. the people sort of decide and own the government. Mm. And the third way is totalitarian or authoritarian. Yeah. I mean, Sharia, mm. you know, communism, mm. <laughs> socialism to an extent. Those are all power-centered mm. structures. And personally, I don't think they succeed, mm. but they don't succeed in a moral sense as well as a physical sense. Mm. And I think having people do what you do through writing, mm. you know, hear their voice or try and hear their voice and honor it and be true to it, I concur that your, your satisfaction later on, 50, 60 years, will um, give you peace of mind mm. and peace of heart, mm. maybe more important. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I, I agree with you. I think with a more educated population, people democratically could impose more rules and regulations on capitalism so that people's less people are less inclined to 
to take advantage of others because they understand the, the human cost. Yes, and we'll muddle through. <laughs> yeah, we will. I think so. I'm optimistic. You, yeah, good. I am too. And it really good. I spend my time partly in Michigan and partly here. Mm. And it's like being in Kentucky. It's two different worlds. I mean, people where I am are sort of optimistic. They're concerned, but optimistic, and they feel mm. they can solve problems here. That's Moine, a very American attitude. As yes, well. yes. British people, generally, misery is the default position. I know. I think they enjoy it. I, yeah, I think so. I mean, somebody enjoyed themselves once, and they were arrested quickly. Yes, and it's too out of control or something. Yeah, but, but unless they're drinking. Oh, tell me about that. Oh, I mean, it's a nation of alcoholics. But there was a time when beer was cleaner than water, so they had no choice. Yeah. Can you imagine? I've got no choice, Mum. The water's too dirty. I have to drink a gallon of beer. <laughs> what a life. Yeah. What part of your British background do you take with you? Still, the the obsolete British background, um, the the Hogwarts more than the Dursley Court. If that's yes. what. It, yes. Yeah. What I mean to say is, there's a um, Britain's almost polarized in a way. Oh. Um, because there's sort of modern Britain, and then there's the problem with traditional Britain is it's tied so much to hatred and colonialism and oppression, but there are some some um, superficial sort of stylistic elements of old Britain that I quite like. Which, which are? Um, traditions, yes. certain traditions. Um, certain traditions of eating or certain traditions of home design, um, of going on holiday, um, of changing socks Interesting. regularly. <laughs> um, taking a bath once a year, whether one needs it or not. Um, but um, so the, yeah, Britain's in an interesting position because uh, it's um, on the one hand, you know, there's there are, there are all these. Mm. Actually, I don't think I can express that properly. I'd have to write it. Well, please do, mm. <laughs> because I think everything we've experienced. Uh, which you actually comment on separately, influences us, and mm. we influence them. And even if we don't know it, something, a smile, a, a, mm. an expression, mm. anything, and we don't honor how, how much all of us educate the people we bump into or talk to or so, mm. but the person we really have to educate is also within. Mm. And that's what you were talking about, you know, Mm. just going down to, to hear that still small voice mm. and to, I think there's a problem of repetition and I'm really thrilled to hear that you use music as a way mm. of, you know, changing the mm. input. Mm. But anyway, I, I, if you don't mind, I'll read mm. a couple of things and I'd like you to expand on this, if you would. Excuse me, everybody, this is the first time for me, you know that. Um, what people think of their lives are merely its conditions. You mentioned that. Mm. Truth is closer than thought and lies buried in what we already know. What is it that we already know? Um, that we're going to die. And um, I think that we spend a lot of energy denying death, while at the same time it propels us to do amazing things, like the idea that you know, the clock's ticking. Um, so it's amazing that something like death, which we can be seen as sort of an enemy of polite conversation, is something that actually drives us to, 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 to really be great. Because if we didn't die, then our decisions would be meaningless. You think that, really? Yeah, because we'd have all the time in the world. Uh, uh, all right. So I think people, all of us, have dark sides and light sides. And I, I hope so. Yes, and so we like to trans, hopefully, mid the dark to something positive, but sometimes not, and that comes out in power over people. Mm. And would that change if you knew you were going to live forever? Maybe it would be more intense. Mm. Well, you know, in the Torah, um, in right. the, or, or, or you know, in the in the in Genesis, yes, the story of Cain and Abel. Oh yes. You know, humans don't do well with rejection. 
Yes, you know? right. No. Um, and so I think that's still very true. I mean, if you look at a lot of people who've caused problems in the world, they were rejected somehow as children, or they were, they were humiliated, or they were... Do you think the cultures, I think cultures emphasize certain aspects of, of uh, personality development or cultural values or something like that. Mm. Some societies are more aggressive, some are softer, and you can form a rebel to what you perceive the society, the culture of the society to be. So for mm. example, someone who grew up in the Soviet Union <laughs> Might have a hard time with trust, you know, but in the range of things, mm -hmm. someone in America, as you say, they're too trusting. We trust, mm -hmm. by and large. Not yeah, everybody. yeah, it's interesting uh, the experiences that we grow up with. You know, I, I, I think about. Uh, I mean, tomorrow's some of tomorrow's um, human rights crises, you know, may come about as a result of the children who were born, you know, during the ISIS movement in the Middle East. Because yeah. those children would have grown up with, you know, execution and murder and extremism. So what will their minds be like as teenagers, you know? It's well, let's funny. talk about this. Like children, they don't want to leave home. Fear of being lost. The fear never goes away and cannot be dispelled. Mm. What does that say about our nature? Well, I think interesting people always feel lost. Yes, I think you're right. I call it, it, it in my own personal life, uh, there's a period of, um, actually it's the most, uh, 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 um, it's, it's the most productive because you have all the choices animating you and then you don't know really what to do. Yeah. But I, I call that sort of yeast, but it's a dip per personally, mm -hmm. to live through. Once you make a decision, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you know, things mm -hmm. get easier, but they get narrower. Yeah. you're on the road to doing that. Yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah. And so um, I, I've had it happen so many times now that when it happens, I say, oh, well, let me find the productive in this. Yeah, that's it. Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre believed that uh, you can't make a wrong decision. Yes, but that's sort of lazy um, because you can make a decision that turns out wrong from which you learn this, mm -hmm. that, or the other. Mm -hmm. But if put it against what you hoped for originally. At that time. At that time, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. it may fall short. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the big thing about America is when I was growing up, if you made a mistake, it was shameful. Really? Shameful. Uh, the people would whisper. Now, if someone makes a mistake, you know, they're starting out of business, they get fired from a job, whatever, mm -hmm. it's an experience. It's a mm -hmm. learning experience. And I think that's good for the society mm -hmm. because life is messy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not everything turns mm -hmm. out well. And if you can view it as a learning experience mm -hmm. and self-correct or s differently choose, mm -hmm. then you have um, a new opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that basically, I think, is American as opposed to sort of the class and the other kinds of ways people Yeah, it's organize. interesting because in certain parts of America, people, you know, claim to be religious and Christian, but they're not very forgiving. No. That's a real test with anyone. Mm. I, I personally, I think you want to live Sharia, you want to live communism, you want to live all the, fine with me. Just don't make me mm -hmm. this way because I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. You know, but it, that's what I talk about, the dark side and the, the lust for power, because mm -hmm. usually they want to obliterate you to conform to whatever they feel works for them or whatever. That's not freedom. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting. that's not generous, in my opinion. And no. it's not Christian, and it's not anything. Well, it's their immortality concept. I mean, I think the lust for power is the fear of death. So they're so afraid hmm. that um, they have these immortality concepts, whether it's Christianity, or Islam or, or um, you know, Judaism, if we conform to these sets of beliefs that we won't die. But if they oh. don't believe it, then there's a chance it's not true. It's easier to get rid of them than to change our ideology. That is really fearful, isn't it? <laughs> there's a great book called The Denial of Death. It was actually JFK's favorite book. No, I didn't know that and I haven't read it. I'll, I'll try and look it up. Everything, everything you need to know is in the introduction. <laughs> You're funny. It's one of those few books, like Freud's Witten, its relation to the unconscious. But the introduction is just stellar. You know, 
know there are people. I was very influenced uh, by a, 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 I think it was a Jewish philosopher, Martin Buber. Do you know mm -hmm. him? His work, in which he sort of basically, in a sentence, characterizes our relationships with people as I it or I thou. Hmm. And when we have an I thou, mm. we are present and we are understanding, and mm. we don't want to mess with them. Right. Like an I it relationship, mm -hmm. I was it's functional or mm -hmm. transactional. Mm -hmm. And I, as I go through my days, I try, you know, not to get too stuck. <laughs> sure. you know, where's the taxi? Yeah. You know. Yeah. So uh, he did not feel love when he saw her, just disappointment at how they would never meet. And he wondered if other people felt uh, things or uh, strangers and then carried the weight of that absence. Mm. In other words, the promise of something mm. that no one knows how to act to, to con you know, this person wanted to contact or think about contacting this mm. person on the street. And I wondered how many aspects of that we find in our lives, uninitiated desires. That's the magical part. I mean, you see somebody go by in a taxi and you think, I could spend my life with that person. Oh, I love that. Just a head. It could just be a head. Yes. Um, you know, those sorts of daydreams where, you know, we're charging on the front horse, you know, in our fantasies. I, I think they're wonderful. But everybody keeps them secret. Yeah. It was, I, have to end right now. I'm so sorry because this is so interesting. So basically, know thyself, go inside, find what you can feel good about. Be sure you can support yourself though, well, that's my addition. Uh, and wonder and realize that you're a changing person and that if you want to encounter and do anything new, it's helpful to put stimulus, in his case music, around you so you can re reconfigure that which you already know. And I think that he takes the, the sense of, uh, it's not possibility, but enchantment, uh, like the head in the taxi, you know, the wondrous of life that we sometimes don't live. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you next week. Blessings, do something kind for someone you know and someone you don't know, and do it every day. Thank you so much. There you go, babe. It was easy. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.